And the discussion this evening is going to be on interbeing interpenetration. And I have to tell you that I, I um, put it as interbeing because many people were introduced to this idea through Thich Nhat Hanh's use of the term interbeing, which is the term that he created for the notion of interpenetration. Um, and so it's a word that was coined by Tip to express interpenetration. And many people, that's how they know the, the idea. And this particular slide actually sort of demonstrates interpenetration as, as it is. And you can look at the handouts that were online and that are here with us right now. Um, this is based upon the, the idea of dependent origination, which is really a foundational <laughs> concept in Buddhism. Uh, it's a principle that all dharmas phenomena arise in dependence upon other dharmas, which is a simple way of saying it. If this exists, then that exists. If this ceases to exist, that also ceases to exist. Most astrophysicists point to so-called Big Bang at the, as the start of the current universe we live in, the arising of all phenomena. And this also happens to be in accordance with the story told in Genesis. The only Difference is that Genesis provides a creator, whereas scientists do not assume attribution. And I'm not about to discuss the physics of that because I'm not qualified. Uh, and I also won't discuss the attribution because neither did Shakyamuni Buddha. What we can acknowledge is that all phenomena arose out of the same stuff. Hello. Good to see you. Welcome. Um, do we have any more? Yes, we do. Okay. Okay. So the basic meaning, going back to the reading, uh, just to, to recapitulate, what we can acknowledge is that all phenom phenomena arose out of the same stuff. The basic meaning of Tung, interpenetration, which has changed little over three millennia of East Asian literary history, is to go through or pass through. And you see the ideograph is close to that meaning. It's often combined with tung in Buddhist text, but it differs somewhat etymologically, as it originally signifies piercing through a barrier or breaking open a passageway where there were none before. And in the original sense, there must always be present the totality of the Dharma, even when exposed to only a small unit of the Dharma. As such, it is not more or less even that small segment in its totality. And here, I just want to make a, a comment, both for the, the folks who are not accustomed to the Buddhist language, that the Dharma represents um, not only the teachings in, in, in the Indic languages, in Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhs, as well as Buddhism. Dharma refers to the teachings. It also refers to the law of nature, the laws of nature. And it also refers to all the phenomena that we see around us. So the term Dharma has many different ways of being expressed. Um, very basically, the doctrine teaches us that no phenomena has independent existence. Whatever is comes into existence because of factors and conditions created by other phenomena. When factors and conditions no longer support that existence, then they cease to exist. What I'm talking about here is we look at dependent origination, which are 12 detail, 12 stages, and one leads to the next, which leads to the next, which leads to the next, and these go in a circular fashion, one starting and continuing on and on and on. That's dependent origination. So from a Buddhist context, nothing arises spontaneously. Everything arises as a result of other phenomena. And so when the reason I mentioned the Big Bang, when we go back to it, and now I, I, I said before, I'm not um, competent to discuss astrophysics, but I have read that that's one of the real issues that is in astrophysics today. And that is, we have the Big Bang. And of course, we recognize that most scholars um, 
most astrophysicists, I should say, will contend there is a Big Bang. Buddhism would say the Big Bang that we talk about now is just one of many that have happened many times before. That, there, that the universe that we are living in right now is just one of many universes that has existed and will continue. They just keep recycling. <laughs> you could say that re the universes are continually reborn. It just takes a long time. Of course, you know, we have a finite life of, let's say, uh, 100 years per person. I mean, hyperbole a little bit there. But so our time span of 100 years per person, our lifespan of 100 years per person, well, that seems like really old. That seems like really long. And, and to this little guy over here, 100 years is really a long time, right? To us who are now in the, the latter chapters of our life, 100 years seems like nah, not such a long time, you know. Um, but the point being that when we think about these universes that continually form and reform and reform and reform, they the discussion among astrophysicists is was all phenomena present at the moment of that big explosion that's referred to as the Big Bang. If we're to look at Genesis, we say Hashem, God, Allah created the universe. What did he create it out of, practically speaking, and is one way to look at this. Was it all the same stuff? Or, well, we're, we're told that, he, that, that God did this in certain stages. This came first and then that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that may very well be. I mean, the astrophysicist says, we don't know. That could be the way it happened. Or it could be that everything happened at once. So that when we look at the elements that we, you know, you, you look at the element chart, the periodic table, and you see that there's nitrogen and there's hydrogen and there's oxygen and all those things, did they all occur at the same moment? Or was there a progenitor of that? Whether you believe in Allah or God or not, I mean, right now, nobody can, can stipulate for sure this is what happened or that's what happened. But the point is, from a Buddhist perspective of the dependent origination, and, and even there, we get into these discussions with one of the schools of Buddhism called Fly Yin as to whether or not they all occur, occurred at the same time or did they occur in some other fashion. Um, at the very least, we accept the notion that within the universe as we know it, that the stuff that we're made of, when I, when I pinch, pinch Shima Sensei used to pinch his hand and say, this is just like the stars. We're made out of the same stuff. That's true. We're made out of exactly the same stuff as the stars and, and the rest of, of, of the universe. One thing, if, if this stopped to exist, ceased to exist, everything would cease to exist. I don't mean my individual skin, but the stuff that is made up in my skin. If that ceases to exist, the universe would cease to exist. That's really what is, what is being claimed here. And the doctrine applies also, it applies to the physical universe that we know. But it also applies, applies to mental and psychological factors, as well as the existence of tangible things and beings. In his teachings on the 12 links of dependent origination, the Buddha explained how an unbroken chain of factors, each dependent upon the last and giving rise to the next, keeps us locked into the cycle of samsara. And samsara is this life that we live. Samsara is referring to the, the existence that we all live. And it has the, the um, notion that the life that we live in is, is, has sorrows. And according to Buddhist teachings, we're born, we get ill, we age, and we die. Those four things can never be denied, right? Those four, four things are the samsaric world, so to speak. So the point is that all existence is a vast nexus of causes and conditions constantly changing. And everything is interconnected to everything else and all phenomena inter-exist. 
But I think that this may be where where Tick got his uh, Han got his notion using changing the term interpenetration to interbeing, insofar as we all are in the state of being, and we're all related. This my being is related to your being and his being, etc. Everyone who is looking at us from Zoom, their being, as it were. Um, so that's where that that notion of interexistence, I think, is is where we're going with this. The most ex extensive examination of interpenetration was the Huayan school of Buddhism that originated in China. Well, originated in the seventh century to the eighth century. I won't go into the history of that, but it represents, and I'm, I'm quoting here, it represents one of the most sophisticated attempts at, in Buddhist intellectual history to explain the nature of reality. Its vision of existence, in contrast, the mainstream Western intellectual tradition sees the universe as an infinite network of entities that acquire their particular existence <laughs> from each other. Because their particular existences are intercausually generated in and out of themselves, they are non-existent, which is to say that in Buddhist terms, they are empty, shunya or shunyata. Since no one particular focus is the absolute cause of all phenomena, any and every locus is the primary and central cause of all phenomena. As such, every entity causally contains every other entity. And this idea is most vividly described or depicted in the Buddhist metaphor of the jewel net of Indra, which we'll discuss in a moment. Why Yen Buddhism is the doctrinal school of the Avantam Sakha Sutra. The English translation of that would be the Flower Garland Sutra. And this, according to the fourfold teaching of Chigi, is the first discourse delivered by Buddha after his awakening under the Bodhi tree. And it seems no disciple could understand it. I say no disciples or other divine beings, heavenly beings, they could understand it, but no people could understand it because it was so profound. So what we're talking about with this notion of interpenetration is when he described that, when Shakyamuni Buddha described that going back now uh, 2,500 years ago, it was such a incredible notion that people just, it just didn't, it didn't make sense to people. How can that be? I mean, astrophysicists 2,500 years later are still talking about it and discussing it and, you know, earning their PhDs over it. <laughs> you know, it's the stuff that theses are made. Um, and this is when he started teaching Nikaya Kipitaka, which is the, the early Buddhist teachings to the Nikaya, the early Buddhists, the earliest disciples. And so he sort of had to change his approach. And instead of going into the most profound teachings first, he said, maybe I better back up and maybe I better do arithmetic before I start teaching quadratic equations, uh, so to speak. And that's, so that's, that's essentially what he did. Uh, and so he gave the early Nikaya a more easily digested set of teachings and paradigms. And in Indra's net, and, and I, I really appreciate this practice. This became a practical experiment. So think of, of what I'm gonna, what you, what I wrote here and what you can read here as sort of a practical experiment. Why Yen Patriarch Pachang in 643, 712, demonstrated Indra's net by placing eight mirrors around the statue of the Buddha, four mirrors around, one above and one below. And when he placed a candle to illuminate the Buddha, the mirrors reflected the Buddha and each other's reflections in an endless series. In other words, in this experiment, he actually placed mirrors above and below and in four places around, and every mirror held the image of every other mirror. It wasn't just a mirror, it wasn't just an image of the Buddha. It was the, it, each one of the mirrors contained every other mirror. We could say that may well have been the first hologram because that's exactly what a hologram is. A hologram is an Im image which is projected and each element of the image contains all the other elements of the image, okay? Because all phenomena arise from the same ground of being, all things are within everything else and yet 
the many things do not hinder each other. Now we come down to the issue of understanding today's world. Thus, each individual is at once the cause for the whole and is caused by the whole and what is called existence is a vast body made up of an infinity of individuals, all sustaining each other and defining each other. Cosmos is in short, a self-creating, self-maintaining and self-defining organism. And again, that was a, that was a quote. From quote. This is a more sophisticated understanding of reality than to simply think of everything as a part of a greater whole. According to Hua Yan, it would be correct to say that everyone is the entire greater whole, but also is just oneself at the same time. This is where it gets a bit dicey to understand. And, and I think that, in fact, we can understand it perhaps intellectually but it becomes more difficult to, under, to sort of really integrate that teaching within us in our daily lives at the very least. So this understanding of reality in which each part contains a whole is often compared to a hologram. How does this apply to the contemporary world? And again, I'm using another quote here. As articulated in contemporary Buddhist literature, interdependence combines empirical description world affirming wonder and an ethical imperative. As empirical description, it represents the world as a vast interconnected web of internally related beings. That is beings whose identity is inseparable from the system of which they are a part. Rather than having an a priori identity independent of these systems, descriptions of this web sometimes melds indistinguishable with descriptions of other interrelated processes like communication networks or biological systems. And so what we have here is the notion of individuality, but the individuality is dependent upon the interconnectedness of the whole. Which I find is really, really a fascinating, really a fascinating thought. And that's why we can apply this also to the environment. If we view ourselves as masters of the environment or just users of resource, then we can go and we can do it without a second thought. But if we view the environment in which we live as a reflection of us, as what we are, when we begin to degrade the environment, we're degrading us. It's not just the environment we're degrading. It's not just the water that we're degrading. And I, I, I think this is amply pointed out when now we have good evidence that almost all people on earth right now have microplastics in their blood. Everyone on earth currently has plastic forcing through their veins. Think about that. We did, plastic didn't exist until, what was the first plastic, 1940s, late 40s, something like that. <clears throat> And yet now, most biologic systems on Earth contain micro levels of plastic. It might be parts per billion or parts per million or parts per trillion, who knows, I don't know. But we all contain it. In other words, we cannot be separate from what we do. And that's the basic teaching of interpenetration. The basic Buddhist teaching is not only cause and effect, but each of us is responsible for everyone else. And we're responsible for everything, not only person to person, which I think is easier to see, but also the environment that we live in. We're responsible for that. If we abuse the environment, then it's going to abuse us, ultimately. I mean, that's a, ba that's a basic teaching. So, um, as I say at the end, it is useful to recall the sacred metaphysical and phenomenological principle as we find reason to separate into separate tribes, parties, and factions. And I should have added, as we look at our environment, what is done to one of us is done to all of us. And I think that we understand that on particular issues, but we don't understand that it goes beyond particular issues. 
it's so pervasive. It is a basic, it is the one of the basic principles, not only of Buddhism, but of the universe and biological systems. So I'll stop speaking there and open it up for questions. Are there? So why don't you unmute folks? And we can oh but actually actually reduce that, go to the next slide. You gotta see this next slide because otherwise. <laughs> That's what I feel like sometimes. <laughs> okay. What questions or comments or thoughts do we have? Anyone at all? Uh, Maynard and Aaron. Oh, for, okay. For, for first, Maynard. Who was that for me? Me yeah, unmute. He's still he's still unmuting. So hold on for a moment there, Maynard. There you go, Maynard. Um, you know the the concept of interconnectedness or interpenetration or interbeing, whatever word we give to it, is one of those. Uh, teachings in Buddhism that creates a kind of enchantment of the world. And, uh, you know, not just in Buddhism, but a beautiful piece of art or just enjoying a child, it creates these enchantments of the world that counterbalances to some extent the suffering that the world experiences as well. Um, of course, uh, inner being when it's described as ending up with plastic in your blood, it sort of takes away the enchantment. That's, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of, uh, <laughs> but I'm just wondering, uh, you know, I, I suspect there are a lot of people who are collecting these enchantments, which certainly Im improve life, you know, including, including cosmic enlightenments, like realizing we're all related through, 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 through sharing the matter with the stars and that sort of thing. But um, I still have trouble figuring out how to sort of string these enchantments together uh, to move you more toward the state of some sort of enlightenment where you really, you know, substantially change the way that you um, uh, experience the world. And, uh, I thought the metaphor of, of inner, inner being, you know, also, you know, having plastic in your bloodstream is, is sort of an example of how there just always seems to be two sides to these things. So it's, it's not really a question, but just a, a comment that somehow that we need to sort of move from the beauty of some of the Buddhist teachings to more closer to enlightenment. And I find trouble uh, making those jokes. Let, let me just give a really quick response to that. There was some who else had their hand. Yeah. Oh, let me give a really quick response to that. And that is the, the reason I did mention the plastic in our blood is because you're right. You know, the idea of interpenetration is also is often given as sort of enchanting story. On the other hand, um, it's not that there are two sides to the story. That's that's what I was going to comment on. It's not that there are two sides to the story. There's this good part, which is enchanting. There's this bad part, which is the plastics in our blood. It really, they're one and the same. And that's part of what the, that's part of what inner penetration is. They're exactly one and the same. There's not a distinction between them. We would have a duality if there were, but there isn't. I mean, that's the point of every particle contains every other particle. Um, and, I, and I, I, that's the middle way. That's the Tiantai middle way. That's really what it comes down to. Uh, Aaron. So my question is actually a little, oops, I'm sorry, wrong button. Um, a little tied to that. Um, my question was like, let's say I'm reciting the Nembutsu with like the three truths of Tentai. Like when I do that, is the ultimate experience supposed to be like interpenetration? Or is that something that's a product of it? Like, is it something that is passively aware? That I'm supposed to be passively aware of? I think, I think we have to get back from thinking of it as, is it supposed to be something? Mm -hmm. 
I think that we have to look at it as when we're doing it, we're doing it, assuming that it's with, with all good intentions and all honesty, et cetera, et cetera, that we're doing it and it will, it is part and parcel of the other. It, there's no, there is no distinction. It's not what it's supposed to be. It's what it is. I mean, that because think of it as more like a principle of the universe as opposed to just a philosophical concept. You know, you can think of, you can, I don't know if that made, if that made sense, if that made sense to you or not. No, yeah. Because I think my question was really like, is it supposed to be this regulative principle that helps me do that? Or is it like that final end of it? No, yeah. it, it's more un, a better understanding of the nature of reality. So it doesn't lead you to awakening. If you incorporated or embodied that awakening, uh, embodied, excuse me, embodied that in a very real fashion, that reality in a very real fashion, awakening would naturally occur. It's not assisting you in that sense. You know, it's not supporting you or leading you someplace, but it's one of those items in which it exists in the universe. And by better understanding it, it opens your mind to the nature of awakening. Uh, Ichishima Sensei, is there anything that you would like to comment on in relation to this? Oh. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, Huayang Sutra is very interesting because uh, one in everything, everything is in one. Well, uh, that, that kind of theory is very important. And others, oh, we have such an uh, explanation. There are 53 teachers in our lifetime. And so uh, Edo period, ancient time, uh, well, uh, old time, uh, they made a uh, stages or stations or inns between Tokyo, Edo, and to uh, Kyoto. There are uh, 53 stages or st uh, inns where people traveling from Tokyo to Kyoto, you see. So, and also Borobdol in, uh, uh, th that is stupa in Indonesia, uh, there is a fantastic explanation that uh, there are four, 53 uh, Buddhas, you know, uh, Zenzai Doji pilgrimage around the, the stupa and finally comes to the top enlightenment. So uh, this is a prize in our lifetime that uh, there are uh, 53 teachers in our lifetime since our, uh, you know, infant age to the uh, old age. I, I think this is also very interesting uh, aspect of Hawaiian Sutra, Ganda Vyuha Sutra. Yes. That is my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Sensei. Are there any other questions or comments from anyone? Okay. okay, so I feel like Shakyamuni Buddha, who sat and gave, uh, I get this item, Joven. Shakyamuni Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. He gave this discourse, and nobody had a clue what he was talking about. That, that's how I feel right now. You know, you got to know enough to ask the question, right? So, uh, Joe, please go ahead. Well, uh, I was hesitant to ask because I don't know exactly how to formulate my question. But uh, when and I and whenever I hear people explain <clears throat> why one should be nice to people around through the category of interdependence uh, uh, by, by saying that because it comes back to you, it, it, it retains the sense of self-serving, self-centeredness. And, I mean, and I don't know whether this kind of explanation is relatively modern or it has very ancient root. I can come up with a different kind of explanation by using the category of interdependence, which is to see reality as a whole as performing symphony. And I also perform, I'm supposed to perform my tune. And if I don't perform my tune, reality as a whole is unable to perform its symphony. This is a different kind of explanation 
it, it's not so self-centered, but the first one that I mentioned and something that it's, uh, Monshi says you presented, I, I see that there's a danger that of how they say this, retaining your self-centeredness or self-serving aspect. Right. And, and, and I, I think that the point that Job is making is very useful. You know, many of the, um, many philosophers would maintain that there is no true altruism. That what we view as altruism, when we do something for the benefit of someone else with no benefit for ourselves, there can never be no benefit for ourselves. So how can there be true altruism? You know, if we, we're receiving some kind of benefit, I think this is a part of the, the issue that Job is, is speaking to. And I, I agree, we shouldn't be looking at interpenetration saying, well, we should be nice to others. We should be nice to the universe. We should be nice to the environment because what we do to the environment will result in what happens to us. On the other hand, you know, I'm thinking about the Metta Sutta right now, where it says when the mother regards her child, her only child, and she treats all other children as her only child, that's the way we should view all sentient beings, as the, in the same sense that the mother views her, her only child. And I think that that is, in a sense, part of interpenetration also. We're not just doing it for us. The mother is not just treating her child the way she does for her own benefit. We can argue from, now we'd be arguing from a sociobiological perspective that if her, her genes are the same as her child's, well, she's even protecting herself if she's protecting her child because she's, she's uh, propagating or she's uh, enhancing her genetic contribution to the world. On the other hand, I don't think that a mother is really thinking about that when she's thinking about taking care of her child. I don't think that the mother is really thinking. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to get into sociobiology of this, um, but I don't think that a mother is really thinking, well, I'm going to really uh, do well for my child because this is, this is extending my genetic contribution. Uh, so it's a on the other hand, there are those who would argue that that's, in fact, what rebirth is. You know, um, so we could we could get lost in the weeds with this. I'll, I'll 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 stop. I'll stop there. But thank you, Joe. That was a that was a very useful example. I think I think looking at it as a player within a symphony. You know, the, the you have a symphony that's going on and. Each individual is playing their own instrument. They're playing the flute, they're playing the violin, they're playing the cello, they're playing the piano, etc. They're playing their own instrument in the way that it's dictated by the sheet music. On the other hand, together, they create something that's much greater than the individual violin or viola or flute or whatever the other instrument it might be. And I think that that's a very useful way of looking at it. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, Aaron, you got your hand up again. Go ahead. Oh, it's just a comment on that, on what Joe said. I think what Joe is, the interpretation he's kind of pointing to is one influenced by William Frederick Hegel and his philosophy of right. And I think there's a an attempt often to do this because both, um, you know, the Flower Garland School and Hegel have a dialectical view, like they reason through dialectically. But Hegel starts from, the idea that you have to start with particular rules or principles, whereas I don't see the Hawaiian school doing that. They kind of start with your perspective. Right. And, and that's, I think, a huge difference. Hey, thank you, Aaron. Nice comment. Any other questions or comments? Jake, go ahead. Jake, what, what it, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned about what you're growing in your, in your room there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it needs to be cleaned but anyway uh <laughs> adding, adding on to the the comments earlier uh especially maynard's comment about how this would relate to enlightenment i feel like it it relates to enlightenment because everything that you're doing is having an impact on everything else and going to job's uh analogy of a symphony the thing is is that you can't really choose not to play 
your your notes because at the end of the day even inaction is a type of action and so you can either choose to do something positive or choose to do something negative and that is then going to impact everything else and so i think that that's kind of the benefit of an idea like this is and i think while it, while it could be enchanting sometimes that can be a good thing especially because there are so many other ideas in buddhism that can if taken the wrong way could potentially be very lead somebody to be very pessimistic so sometimes you need something like that to balance it out to realize that uh you know because then it leads into something like the 3000 thoughts in a, in a 3000 realms in a single thought which is getting into a different subject but very much a related one thank you it is related, yes. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, if they're not, I'm going to turn it over to Koshin. Any... Did you want to send out? I'm sorry? Did you want to send out? No, it, it's, we'll all go out together. You're just going to have to suffer, that's all. Okay, I'll, I'll do a quick explanation. So we are now going to uh, leave the group in the gathering room and we're going to go out to the hondo and we'll turn it over to Koshin and uh, he will continue with you and I thank everyone for attending and thank you for your participation and I think we had some really good comments it's this idea of interpenetration I think is um, I understand why Shakyamana Buddha gave up on explaining it uh, <laughs> sitting under the Bodhi tree and went on to something easier. So, thank you. By the way, the Abhintam Sakra Sutra is by far the most, one of the most difficult sutras to really get through. All 1,000 pages in English. <laughs> uh, just bear with us, folks. We'll be we're just going to let everyone... So, everyone, we're going to be going into the... Oh, hey, Adam. I didn't see you back. <laughs> I was late, sorry. That's okay. Um, if you've ever had a meal uh, at, here at the Dharma Center um, in any formal setting, we usually do a prayer uh, before the meal. <clears throat> and it starts uh, by saying, 72 laborers brought us this food. We should know how it comes to us. And it's a simple phrase, but um, it's usually used in a monastery and uh, where traditionally it took 72 labors um, for the monks to be able to have a meal placed in front of them. So whether that's um, from the farms uh, around the monastery or things like that, it, it generally 72, right? Um, but nowadays, obviously that can, uh, it stands outside of the monastery, it stands for the millions of labors that it takes for food to actually land on our table. Um, and in, in, in any part of our daily lives. Um, and so the, the interbeing is the recognition that we can't be without um, others also being. And we don't live autonomously, as Sensei was saying, we don't sporadically come out of nothingness. Um, and so as we sit for a meal, to recognize the massive number of people uh, and machinery and vehicles and grocery stores, and distribution centers, whatever uh, that it takes to get to the food where uh, for the food um, that we have, this knowing knowing how it comes to us is the simple way to explore uh, what it takes for even the simplest things um, in, in our lives, like eating. And so, to consider what did it take, who was involved, uh, how many labors can you count? All these um, are ways to realize just how profound and expansive it can get. Um, it, you know, for example, I, you know, I think of like uh, the planting labor, just even just think about planting. The, the farmer pr um, probably is using a tractor, right? Uh, and so where did the seeds come from? Who built the tractor? Where did the gas come from? Uh, each one of those can have its own rabbit hole of interpenetration, you know? And that's just the planting portion. When, when it, you know, since he was bringing up Thich Nhat Hanh, and, and, and the, he, he brings this up a lot, which is this idea, what he terms mindfulness. And 
it's the recognition that in all things, there are all things. Um, and in a Buddhist context, this is shmirti. This is like intentional awareness. And when we, if we were to take a tree, for example, not, not only is the sun in it to help grow the tree, but the bugs, the fungi, other plants around it, uh, the wind, the rain. So no longer can we kind of define it as tree. It's all of those things. So where does this idea of tree start and, and, uh, and all the other things that led to and or sustain the tree end? When, when we start to explore what inter interbeing actually means, we can start to have an appreciation for all phenomena, even the undesirable or the unpleasant um, ones. Right now, you are who you are because of all phenomena, good and bad, or bad. And that's amazing. <laughs> that's amazing. Taking the time to recognize that interpenetration of all phenomena allows for the seed of gratitude and humility to blossom. With gratitude and humility, we can start to dissolve our notions of self or self-importance, but also how we are all part of everything else. Our sense of self now becomes undefined, but also expansively complex. So where, where does that sense of self stop compared to all the other things that help sustain and maintain us or have led to us? Same as the tree. You know, I, I think about, this is a total aside, but in your body, if you consider yourself to be an amalgam of, let's say, 100 billion cells, 90 billion of them don't have your DNA. When, as we grow, our bodies naturally shed our skin. Um, our skin is about five years old from like inner layers of skin out to outer. And if, as we slough up, it regenerates. Our stomach lining is within weeks. You know, we are constantly recycling ourselves. So then who are, what, what, who are we? What is that? We, we rely on the things that are sustaining us to maintain who, the self, concept of self. We can be because everything else is. We are not alone, ever. As I sit here, I'm surrounded by all the things that led up to this moment. We are cute. When we take a moment, look at your computers right now. You're all looking at it or some sort of tablet or whatever. So conservatively, again, millions of labors, right? For all the things that make up a computer. And so if you can think about, can you see all the people that are in that computer? Can you uh, feel, like, think about all the elements that are in the computer? Where did the computer have to go and come back to to get shipped to where you are? There's all that, the, the people's energies, the things that constitute its energies, all in, in this, just this one thing. And I am surrounded by all the things. So th this is where we start to talk about how interpenetration is pervasive, it, it, how pervasive it can be. And so what, how, when you tap into that, what impact does, does that have on you? When you stop to consider what it takes for things to be or for, for you, what it takes for you to be, when you start to tap into that, what, what stirs up in you? Take the time to explore the 72 labors before a meal, for example. You know, um, uh, Maynard was here. I, I wish he had stayed, you know, um, it, it's, it's the reminders. For me, it's the reminders. That, that it can be a simple, fun exercise. I, I get that, you know, it's fun to go right down rabbit holes. But, but over time, the practice of reflecting and reminding impacts and, and changes our perce perceptions. 
or perspective, you know? And so we might interact with those phenomena differently when we start to understand how we're inter are, how we inter are. Experiencing the interbeing is foundational to that Buddhist practice, okay? Get outside of yourself and see that we all depend on each other and on all the other things. We inter are. Therefore, bring grace, awareness, gratitude, humility to that interbeing for the sake of all other phenomena. Swaha. And for the quote, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff. It's Carl Sagan. Good old Sagan. Gosh.